book of Ephesians chapter number four. I'm excited about this message. It's another in our series that I'm calling Power Verses, or verses that most of us have heard before and maybe even know really well, probably have heard sermons on them before, but I love to preach these verses. I love to preach them because I need them again. Do you ever find that when you have a familiar verse, a familiar passage, that it kind of becomes old hat to you? That it's lost some of that, that glamour, perhaps, some of that dazzle. And when you look at it again and afresh, it's like, man, I really needed that. And I've enjoyed studying these verses because you look at it like, man, well, this is a verse that most of our children in children church know. This is a verse that you as parents have probably quoted to your children and have had them quote back to you. It's that familiar. It's not the shortest verse in the Bible. That's John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. It's not that short, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 32. If you look at there, you may not even need to look at it, but would you look at the scripture with me? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye, give me the next word, kind. One to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Lord, I pray you'd help us the next few moments as we look at this verse, Lord, this verse that was given to us by you, your Holy Spirit, through Paul. Lord, help us to have our hearts touched by your word. Lord, may we not just look at this verse and because we may have known it and know it well and be able to quote it, forget the truth that is bound up in this verse. Lord, would you open our hearts and our ears. May we be, may we be good soil for your spirit to work. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. And be ye kind one to another. How many parents have taught their children that verse before? How many have had your parents, when you're younger or now, say that verse to you and make them, and you had to quote it back to them? We've done that. All right, Johnny, be ye kind. That means be kind to your brother James and your sister Danielle. Oh, James, is that being kind? Remember Ephesians 4, 32. Boy, this verse is quoted all over the place, and we quote it to our friends, to our, to our children. And we, we view kindness in different ways. Sometimes we view kindness as giving money to somebody. And be ye kind, well, here's $1,000. You should all practice that today. I'll be up here at the end of the service. But is that what it means? It could involve that. It could involve this concept, and, and often there's an act of kindness uh, in a monetary sense, but that's not all this verse means, is it, though? In fact, that's not even the primary idea of this verse, to give money to somebody else, when it says, and be ye kind. Does it mean helping a, a lady who's stuck in the rain on the side of a highway trying to change a flat tire, men? Is that be ye kind? And we pull off the highway, we stop, we change a tire, and get back in our car, and we kind of feel good about ourselves, don't we? And be ye kind. That was, that was me, Lord. You, you, good thing you've got me in your infantry. I'm, I'm being kind today. That's how the world kind of treats this, this concept and idea. In fact, there's a, there's a day, it's April 20th, and uh, this next year in 2020, it's April, 20th, April 28th, I'm sorry. It's called Pay It Forward Day. Pay It Forward Day is a day that nationally you're supposed to do something nice for somebody else and instead of pay it back, you pay it forward. So if you're at McDonald's, the idea is that at McDonald's you say, listen, I'll pay for the car behind me as well. I pay it forward. And hopefully when they get there and they find out, boy, that guy in front of you paid you, you, you know, your, for your happy meal and your heart attack in a bag, that they'll say, wow, that's wonderful. I can go on to live another day. And they pay for the next person. And before long, there's millions of people touched by these acts of kindness. Or you're at Starbucks and you say, you know what, I'll buy this guy coffee and that guy, you know, because it's supposed to be an act of, of kindness. Now, oddly enough, I was at Starbucks, I think it was last week, there were two police officers in front of me. I, I always try to do something for the police officers if, if they're in a restaurant. I tried to buy their coffee and they wouldn't let me. Apparently, I was in Midland, they said in Midland, it's against their policy to buy coffee for police officers. So I threw it on them and said, fine. And uh, no, I didn't do that. But is that what it means, a, a pay it forward day? In fact, on the pay it forward day website, they want this global initiative to be felt around the world. They want billions of people touched by kindness. Well, is that what this verse means? And, and be ye kind? Does it mean and, and pay it forward one to another? It could involve that. But that's not the primary application of this verse now, is it? It's a lot deeper than that. There's another thing. It's called random acts of kindness. 
In fact, it's now a trademark. It's a website, randomactsofkindness.org. If you happen to go there, don't do it now, please, while I'm preaching. But if you happen to go there, they say this. We've taken our Castle-approved, highly effective, evidence-based kindness in the classroom, social, emotional learning curriculum, and made it better. That's a mouthful. By including a focus on equity, teacher self-care, and digital citizenship, we're excited to share a more engaging, relatable, and inclusive curriculum for random acts of kindness. It's a whole curriculum now. You can learn to be kind at school. Well, that's a novel idea, right? In fact, I, I downloaded the Random Acts of Kindness calendar. So helpful. One thing was borrow a pen or put an extra pen in your pocket, and the first person that asked to borrow one, give it to them. Wow, that's tremendous. I am so glad that they gave me a calendar to do that, right? What does it mean to, to be kind? There's a story about a woman who was standing at a bus stop. She had just cashed her tax refund check, so she was carrying, she says, a little more money than usual. She happened to glance around and noticed a shabbily dressed man standing nearby. As she watched this shabbily dressed man, she watched uh, 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 another man who was a, maybe a little better dressed, and this man walk up to him, hand him some money, and whisper something in the man's ear. This lady was, was so touched by this exchange that she thought about the money that was in her pocket that she took a $10 bill. She walked up to the man who wasn't dressed very well and she said, here, and she whispered in his, in his ear, never despair, never despair. The next day, she had me back at the, at the bus stop. The same man who was there the, the day before was, came up to her and he handed her $110. She was taken back. She, she said, what's this? He said, oh, never despair, paid off 10 to 1 at the races. <laughs> Random acts of kindness. Is that what the verse means? I don't think so. I would, with the Lord's help, look at this verse as it applies to us, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. The first thing I see in this verse is an exhortation, an exhortation. And be ye kind. It's a command. It's an exhortation. It is something that we must do. It's not just a suggestion. Hey, think about being kind. Hey, why don't you consider being kind? He says, and be ye kind. There is an exhortation here for us. It is inescapable exhortation. We can't pass it off to somebody else. It is for me. It is for you. In fact, I say it this way. It's singular. It is personally challenging. You see, I just can't think about this sermon and say, well, you know what? I hope my wife is kind, though I hope she is to me. It's not for her. It's for me. And you can sit there and say, well, I hope my spouse is listening. I hope that person is listening to the sermon. No, this exhortation is for you and it's for me. It's an exhortation that is singular. It's personally challenging. But it's also practically challenging. It says, in, be ye kind one to another. The strange thing I noticed as I did some little bit of, a little bit of research on that website, Random Act of Kindness, and Pay It Forward, they had a very big emphasis on being kind to strangers. They, they, they almost said it, not quite in these words, that, that they hoped that many strangers would be touched by these things. In fact, one said, especially to strangers to be helpful to. But this verse doesn't say necessarily to just be kind to strangers. In fact, it says, and be kind one to another. Now, why would the Bible include those few words? Is it because Paul was filling up more space on the scroll, on the parchment? Was he like, oh man, I, I better add some more words and be kind one to another? I don't think so at all. All scriptures given by inspiration is profitable. It was given by God and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the King James, they got it right. Be kind one to another. Apostrophize a theory. You ever find it's harder, harder to be kind to those you know better? You ever find it's harder to be kind to those maybe you love more, to those you're familiar with? Whereas you may stop to help the lady who's broken down by the highway if your spouse needs something, not so quick. I wonder if I showed up at your house and asked for a glass of water. If your ladies would say, Pastor Howell, absolutely, one cube, two cubes, what would you like? Lemon, lime, I'll give you a glass of water. But if your husband asks, eh, get it yourself, you lazy guy. And be ye kind 
one to another. Or if my wife was, was broken down in the parking lot, would you jump there and say, yeah, Mrs. Howe, Mr. Doreen, we'll help you, we'll jump the car, but if your wife breaks down, honey, I told you not to drive the car that way. You know, if it makes a slight clicking sound, that's whatever it is. And, you know, I think if we're not careful, we find it hard to be kind to those who are closest to us. And yet the verse says, and be kind one to another. It definitely applying to those who are around the church. We can look around this auditorium and we see people, one another. People that we know, people that we ought to love the right way. And the Bible says, those people right there, that's where you start. Be ye kind. Does it mean we're not kind to strangers? Well, absolutely not. The Bible teaches that about God's love. But this verse does say, be ye kind one to another. It's practically challenging means perhaps that person that you've seen for the last 35 years and this Sunday they sat in your seat be ye kind oh I'll be kind to them that means uh, people that parked by in the church parking lot and that's where your door of your car got dinged more car doors get dinged at church than anywhere else I think and be ye kind one to another that means in your house with your spouse, with your mom, with your dad, with your brother, your sister. And be ye kind one to another. Not only is it personally challenging, it is practically challenging. Oh, we know that. Sometimes we forget that. Not only is it singular, but it's separate. If you look at this verse, the, verse, the first word of the verse is and. An interesting word to begin a command with. And it obviously alludes to something previous, right? There's something before that, and be ye kind. If I was just mumbling up here, I said, and don't do this, you say, well, what else did he say? And, and be ye kind. Is there something else attached? Well, I look back at verse 31 where Paul says this, let all bad bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You see, before we can be kind the way we ought to be kind, the way that would honor the Lord, the way that would be, uh, exemplify Christ toward us, we have to make sure that we put off some things. And this verse says that bitterness, that, that poison that's sharp or unpleasant, the I can't stand you. You understand that bitterness has no place in a Christian's life. Bitterness has no room, it should have no room in a Christian's spirit. Yet there's people in here who struggle with bitterness toward another person who is in this room. Pastor Howell, you don't know what they did to me 14 years ago. Sometimes with validity. Sometimes people have been very hurt. Very, very hurt. A lot of times, not so much. They walked down the hallway, did not even shake my hand. I'll never speak to them again. Let all bitterness be put away. They made fun of me in high school. I'll never speak to them again. Yeah, but you're 75. Let it go. Yet, what do we do? We hold on to it. That hurt. That sharp, unpleasant, I can't stand you. And boy, we like to mask it well. We smile at that person. We shake their hand. And on the inside, you could stab them. It's bitterness. The complete opposite of verse 32. And Paul says, let all bitterness, wrath, the boiling up and subsiding, the, the yelling, what, the, the explosion, let the wrath be put away, away from you. And the anger, the violent passion, the vengeance, I will get you back. So that anger is, I'm just waiting for the day. A few years back, when Brother Fusco and Brother Wilson were both on staff here, they got engaged in a little bit of practical, uh, practical joke, a little pranks back and forth with each other. Boy, and they were going back and forth, and quite enjoyable to watch two other people kind of go at it. And it was all in good fun, all in, all in jest. One day, Brother Fussell came to me, and he said, he said, J.D., I need a really good idea to get Brother Wilson. Do you have a good idea? I do, actually. I have lots of good ideas, and I don't have to enact them typically. So I said, here's what you should do. I said, you need to go down to AutoZone. You need to buy a locking gas cap and put it on his car. I said, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I said, and then you need to hide the key somewhere on his car because what's going to happen? He's going to get in trouble at a gas station and you're not going to be around. You don't want to drive there, okay? So hide it somewhere in his car. He's like, oh, that's a great idea. I'll do it. 
Well, he got it, put on his car, hit it, and then begin the waiting game. Well, Wilson, he had, he had that little red Ford or Chevy something, a little red car. I don't remember, you remember what kind of car that was? Something small that would go like 5,000 miles on two gallons. All right, so you put this locking gas cap on, not like my truck. I mean, it's like three days I'm putting more gas in. It was like two weeks. Right, that we're waiting. We didn't forget. Oh, no, no, no. Brother Wilson, I forget what he had done to Brother Fusco, something before that. They were going at it, like I said, going at it. And, and one day, Brother Wilson comes in, doesn't say a word. Brother Fusco says, hey, man, you're getting gas in your car. And Brother Wilson just began to you know, spew about what happened with this, with this gas cap. He had found the key, thankfully. He never called. He never called. And they got back and forth, good jest. But you know, some people do that and not in jest or fun. Waiting for the opportunity to get that person back. That's that anger. Bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. You did this and I can't stand this evil speaking. That word is from the root word of, of blasphemy, not just toward God, but toward each other. It, it's like the idea that you say, you know what? Do you know what that jerk did? It's injurious speech towards someone else and malice. Evil desire with no known boundaries. I will do whatever it takes to make you suffer. You see, the command, the exhortation is, and be ye kind. And because as Christians, we're supposed to put those type of actions and attitudes and words out of our vo vocabulary and out of our spirit. Let them go. They have to go away. They have no place in the Christian's life. And be ye kind. There's an exhortation that's singular and separate. But there's also an explanation. There are three different words here used to explain this idea. Be ye kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. I think they're great. They each paint a different facet, a different facet of the diamond of this idea of kindness. The kindness, the graciousness, and politeness. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Christians, if we adopted just that first word, just were practiced being gracious to people, saying things like, thank you, and please. Does it not, does it not seem like a lost art in 2019? Can, can for one moment, can we call this day old-fashioned day and lament the fact that people have stopped saying please and thank you? Anybody else feel this? It seems that way in the world that we've lost that. That's what this idea is of be ye kind. Be gracious, be polite, and be ye kind. Be gracious one to another. Thank you for that. Would you mind doing this? Be ye kind, tender-hearted means compassionate. Empathetic. Being able to share burdens, being able to share needs. It's one reason I love this church. It's a great church. I love being here. We have a lot of tender-hearted people at First Baptist Church. You have a need, there are folks that will pray for you. And it's here, not just say they'll pray for you, they will pray for you. They'll ask how you're doing. That's tender-hearted. Not only that, we have a lot of wonderful ladies who make meals for people. What a blessing. Tender-hearted compassion. We have people in this church who will help you at a moment's notice, bail you out of a problem. That's tender-hearted. That's the way Christians are supposed to be, gracious, polite, compassionate, and then forgiving. That one's a little bit tougher. That's where the bitterness slips in. I read a story of a young man who was a Christian. He formed the habit of praying beside his bed before he went to sleep every night. He was a young man, and he joined the army, and he kept up that practice of praying by his bedside every night, and eventually it is, in his army unit became an object of mockery and ridicule in the barracks. One night, as he knelt to pray, one of the men who would torment him took off his muddy boot and threw one at a time and hit him in the head. The whole room was laughing, and the Christian said nothing back, but took the boots and placed him by his bedside and continued to pray. Next morning, when the other soldier, the tormentor, woke up, he found his boots polished and shined by his bed. As the story goes, it so affected him that he asked for forgiveness, and after a while, he became a Christian. That's what kindness, compassion, and forgiveness does. Forgiveness to restore quickly internally and externally, and to restore fully. What if Jesus Christ forgave like you forgive? Well, I don't think you really mean it. 
I don't think you're serious about that. What if that's how Jesus forgave us? What if we came to pray at the end of the service and as we're praying at the altar to ask, Lord, Lord, help me to do this. Please forgive me for doing this. Jesus spoke from heaven. And he said, you've asked me for that seven times. I'm not forgiven this one. What would we do? Yet, we're supposed to forgive quickly, internally and externally, and forgive fully, restore fully. And lastly, I see the experience. That first part of that command, that exhortation, would be wonderful all by itself. If that's all we had, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, that would be enough. That would be enough for us to walk out of this room and, and say, you know what, I need to be kind. It'd be enough to walk out and say, I need to be gracious, I need to be compassionate, I need to forgive, I need to put off these things. But the verse doesn't stop there. There's that last phrase, if I can, it's that last phrase that kind of cements the deal, where he says, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Just in case you need some further motivation, just in case obeying the Bible is not enough, just remember what God did for you. Just remember what God did for me. You see, I've been forgiven before I messed up. You know, Christ died for my sins before I was even born yet. Before I even messed up, I was forgiven. Before I even was alive on this earth, Christ died for my sins. I've been forgiven before I messed up. The spirit of forgiveness. I've been forgiven and I've messed up. How about you? You see, when I was six years old, I asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. Realized I was a sinner. I couldn't go to heaven on my own. And that Jesus died for my sins and by trusting in him and him alone, he would save me and take me to heaven when I die. I was six years old. About a year and a half ago, I went back to this spot in that Sunday school classroom where I got saved. It's in Pensacola, Florida. I don't remember much, but I remember that day. There was a flannel graph in the corner. You folks remember flannel graphs? I don't know what was on it, but I remember that day. That's when I was saved. And thankfully, since I was six, I've never messed up. Yeah, right. You could, please don't, just ask my wife. You see, I've been forgiven and messed up. Christ forgave me for my sins that day when I was six, but I've messed up. And in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You know what? Sometimes I mess up in the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I've got kids. Sometimes they do the same dumb things. And as a parent, you think, are you ever going to get this? What's wrong with you? Did I have any intelligent children? Yet I wonder, and he doesn't, but if God thinks he's ever going to get this. I've been forgiven and messed up. All my sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. Because I've been forgiven, lastly, more than I've messed up. God's forgiveness is way bigger than me. God's forgiver, forgiveness is way bigger than my failings. It is sufficient for my failings, but it's way bigger than me. And this verse ends with this truth. Listen, be kind one to another. Don't just quote it to your children. Don't just say it in Sunday school. Be kind, be tenderhearted, be forgiving one to another. In case you need some motivation, just remember what I've done for you. What would happen if as Christians in this church, we begin to take this truth to heart, begin to forgive, begin to be compassionate and be kind, not the way we feel like it, not the way someone deserves it, but the way that God, for Christ's sake, did it for us. What would happen? Revolutionary. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, you died on the cross for us to offer us that forgiveness. Lord, you've been so good to me. I wonder this morning if you're there in your seat and maybe you know this verse very, very, very well. But I wonder if the Holy Spirit touched your heart this morning. I wonder if as I was preaching and sharing God's word, if the Holy Spirit touched your heart. The Holy Spirit said something. That's you. You need this right now. One who would say, Pastor Howe, would you pray for me? God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me that I respond to him the right way? Amen. Slip that hand up, slip back down. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. A familiar verse, familiar truth, but one that we often forget. Who else? I didn't raise my hand before. I'll raise it now. God spoke to me today. Would you pray for me? Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never asked Jesus to save you from your sins. In fact, if you died today, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. I wonder if I could pray for you when I pray with the others. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. But if that's you, if you say, you know what, Pastor Al, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll acknowledge it and won't cause any more attention to you. Say, that's me. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up, slip it down. I'll see it. Amen. Amen. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know our heart. Pray your spirit would have the liberty and freedom that we want it to have. In Jesus' name.